Good evening, everyone. Welcome to your latest Wolves Fancast match preview. I'm your host, Little Dan. And as you can see, on joining me on this evening's show, I've got with me uh, Eddie at Wolves Football Shirts. How are you? Good evening. Yeah, good. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. Been a long while. Uh, those who aren't aware, Eddie is a Wolves shirt collector. Well, Wolves merchandise collector. Um, yeah, merch, yeah, go and check his... Uh, Hats, Go and ties. check his pages out at Wolves Football Shirts on Instagram. Join us tonight on the Wolves Fancast Match Preview. Previewing the match at home to Newcastle on Saturday is uh, Kendall Rowan. Uh, she's a Newcastle fan. How are you, Kendall? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm good as I can be after last night, I guess. But yeah, um, yeah I'm good. Thank you. I'm, I am going to apologise in person for predicting <laughs> that Newcastle were going to win 3 0 to you yesterday. I genuinely thought on the back of their um, PSG um, hammering that I thought Newcastle were just going to turn up and steamroll and um, brush your door. But we'll talk a bit more on that uh, in depth a bit later on. And as you can see, bottom right, uh, midfield general. Guy who I've been flirting with over the years on um, on Twitter. <laughs> I even called him better than Ruben Nevers at one point, and he was modest enough to say that he wasn't in the same calibre. We've got Wolves legend Simon Osborne. How are you doing, Ozzy? I'm very good, thanks. I'm uh, pleased to be on. You have been chasing me, I know, but I've been playing hard to get for you, that's all. It's all it's all it's all's well that ends well. Uh, this weekend, you're featuring for the Wolves All-Stars at Bilston Town against the FA Veterans. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, obviously the All-Stars have been going for, for some time. I live in London, so it's a bit difficult. And every now and then, obviously, certain games I try and get up for. It's, it's, it's very special. Obviously, Jason Guy does a lot of work for the charity, works really closely with Mel to get some stuff. So it's supporting his daughter's two charities, his and obviously his late wife. So uh, we're trying to get as many people up to that on, on Sunday. Touch wood, the weather will be OK. Um, it's only a couple of pound entry down at Bilston there. So... I shall turn out for a little bit. I get excited. My knee's not very good. Um, I say I'm going to play about 20 minutes, get on the pitch, think I'm about 21 again, um, end up running around and then spend the next two weeks basically hobbling around, icing my knee. So it's it's great. An absolute football extravaganza. I called it on Twitter the other day. Wars Newcastle Saturday night at 5.30. And, if, and then obviously it's a bit of an all day, isn't it? 5.30 kickoff. So if you can pull yourselves out of bed on Sunday, guys. Get yourself down to uh, Dawson Town. You see some of the players there, some proper old school legends there. Jody Craddock, uh, Paul Jones, the goalkeeper, um, Adam Prelock, Say George Olyphant-Yana, Matty Hill. I've already mentioned uh, Simon Osborne. You've got some old classics, Kevin Ashley, Mickey Arms, Colin Taylor, uh, and then and Melly's BBC WM commentator, as well as some... uh, old school legends like Carl Akimi, Ali Robertson, Robert Dennison, one of my favourites, Robert Dennison, will be attending on on Sunday. So, like I said, head over to uh, Bilston Tennis. £2 entry, guys. I mean, for that calibre of uh, legends there. And there will be some decent players in the FA Veterans side. So, like I said, if you can make yourself available on, on Sunday, get yourself down to Bilston Town. Uh, tickets uh, are available via Eventbrite. There's a link at the bottom of the screen and we'll be sharing it across our social media at Wolves Fancast. So yeah, thanks for joining us tonight on the Wolves Fancast. The OD Network po- uh, podcast providers are uh, our main guys who we support and the Boston Coffee Vending Company. The uh, the big game this weekend is for us is obviously Wolves at home to Newcastle, but the rest of the fixtures start tomorrow night uh, with Palace at home to Spurs. Chelsea Brentford is the Saturday lunchtime kickoff, followed by Arsenal, Sheffield United, form of Burnley. Kendall, obviously last night wasn't the result that you were hoping for. Still mm. in a quite promising position in, in the group um, against PSG, Borussia Dortmund. Um, what's your sort of thoughts on last night's performance? Yeah, it was just, you know what, it was just like, you know, one of those games where everything just goes wrong. Like, there were so many below par performances from us, which is like really unusual to have more than one, I guess, every game because we, we perform pretty highly most games. Um, so it was just, yeah, Trippier was just not great and he's been like our absolute stalwart since he signed. He wasn't at his best and um, plenty of them weren't. We obviously got a couple of serious injuries that game as well. So Isaac came off, he's now out for five games. Um, Jacob Murphy dislocated shoulder. Uh, and yeah, it just really came down to just, I guess, lack of experience and um, I think, to be fair, pretty much everyone I spoke to expected us to beat them and I didn't expect us to, but I just wanted us to win our home games in the Champions League and that's just what I um, really wanted from this experience and obviously that didn't happen yesterday. So, yeah, I think it was just a, a mix 
a few bad things really, but we haven't got time to think about it to be honest, because the turnaround now in the league, especially coming up to the Christmas period and stuff, is just so quick. Um obviously we've got you guys on Saturday, and um, then we've got Man United away on Wednesday the following week in the League Cup. So yeah, it's just uh th- coming thick and fast at the moment, really. So we haven't got time to dwell, to be honest. Like you said, everything seemed to go wrong for you last night from sort of yeah. the 15th minute onwards. Obviously, one of the things that I noticed on uh, social media today was lack of atmosphere was was questioned. A lot of the fan base, like myself, probably assumed you were just going to steamroll Bushy or Dortmund. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, the atmosphere was strange last night. I mean, the, the weather was atrocious, to be fair. But that doesn't usually stop Georgie, so I'm not sure what happened last night. Um, it was great up until about, as I say, until Isaac came off and then the mood just switched because I think we realised after Wilson had come on, like that, it just wasn't the game for him. And then it just, the atmosphere just went relatively flat. We're a reactionary crowd. We always have been. So when the game's flat, the crowd's sort of flat. Um, obviously, I'm, I, probably a lot of fans can kind of relate in that aspect. So yeah, um, it was a bit strange. I've been going for like 17 years now to games and um, the atmosphere there was probably one of the best I've ever seen against PSG. So yeah, it was a little bit strange last night. But again, you're not going to get that occasion like every single time we play in the Champions League because that was like the first time of our Champions League back at home after 20 years. So it was like one, a one-off occasion, do you know what I mean? It's not going to be like that every single time. So yeah, but we just like something to whinge about now because you, you can't whinge about the results. You can't whinge about the football or the manager. So we just try and find something else to whinge about now, I think. So it's, yeah, that, the atmosphere is the uh, the villain this week, I think. <laughs> yeah, that is a Plus classic. Mike, Mike Ashley's not available to be uh, mound at anymore, is he also? <laughs> No, you know, exactly. jumping in there, and I think what you've got is you're playing an experienced Champions League team yeah. in Dortmund, and with the greatest respect to them, they've been around and seen it and done it. Mm. I think you know they quieten down a Newcastle crowd. It's it's something we talked about as players. They probably quieten down a Newcastle crowd. Say if we can keep it nice and tight for 10, 15 minutes, you know, get rid of that atmosphere. I mean, I don't think anyone expected what happened against uh, PSG with the greatest yeah. respect. Nobody did, and I think they've seen that, and that maybe shocked everybody, but. If you're a Newcastle fan, would you have taken the three results that you've had already? Probably. Absolutely, yeah. I think everyone would have at this point. Definitely. I don't think we would have even expected to have had uh, like four points at this point in the Champions League. So, yeah, definitely to take the three results we've got at the minute. That is a tactic that's went, went against us a lot over the years, as it's keeping the Molyneux crowd a bit restless to sort of first 10, 15 minutes and then build your way into the game. What have you made to um, Newcastle season so far, Ozzy? To be honest here, obviously, since he's taken over, it's been, you know, from Newcastle fans and listening to those sort of people, the the right, there's a plan. Obviously, there's a plan, but I think they're way ahead of the plan. Um, you know, to see that first game was amazing. The atmosphere is always brilliant. I've, I've been lucky enough to play there once a long, long time ago, but in, the atmosphere is amazing. And, they're, you know, the fans are great. Um, I just think that, again, there was probably a little bit, it's almost like after the Lord Mayor show, you've had the, the, the PSG coming into it, everybody's expecting. And sometimes it, it, it doesn't quite happen like that. With the injury, I think it sort of knocked him out of kill. And Eddie Howe said, obviously come out today and said, you know, the first half, we weren't anywhere near the Newcastle. We were a little bit better in the second half. But again, they've hit the crossbar, they've hit the, you know, the, the crossbar and whatever else a couple of times. One of them just a slightly bit different and it, it, it all changes. But they, they've been brilliant. You know, it, nobody expected them to be where they are. And now, unfortunately, they're there to be shot down. You know, they've gone from being a, a club sitting in 19th place when Eddie Howe, I think it was, took over to now sitting in the Champions League spots and everyone's talking about it in the top six again. So with that comes expectation, unfortunately. And then, and like I said, as, as Kendall was saying, there a few players were just a little bit below par who have been absolutely brilliant for them. Um, and I think, like you say, Newcastle fans will moan and whinge, but, you know, come come Saturday again, they'll be back on it. And fortunately, lucky enough, I'm able to come up and watch the game. So it'd be great to come and watch. It's like you said, Kendall, everything that went wrong, wrong could, could have went wrong yeah. last night. Whereas the PSG game, you got players like Fabian mm. Shaw scoring world. Is it's like the, yeah. this, that's just <laughs> that's football, isn't it? Eddie, we just talked about Newcastle there. You look at some of the stats from there this season. First in the rankings for the amount of goals scored, expected goals, shots on target in the box, shot conversion rate, big chances created. Team that, although they've got a few players missing on Saturday and Wolves being at home, they're still, they're still a really tough side to come up against. Um, yeah, no, of course. I mean, uh, Newcastle of, of uh, under Eddie Howe have looked like a tremendous team. And, you know, players like Anthony Gordon, questions are asked over his signing. Isaac, a couple of questions are maybe asked over his signing. have been quality players. Um, Kieran Trippier, a highly underrated player. Obviously, he had a bit of uh, a time with England, but I always feel if Gareth Southgate 
you know, would choose players on form over that kind of loyalty that he should get more of a look in the England lineup because he's been brilliant uh, for Newcastle, uh, their best player since they picked him up. Uh, and then Bruno Gemarash in the middle, um, yeah, putting it all together. Obviously, the big news today is tonally um, getting suspended for 10 months and how that will affect uh, Newcastle moving forward. How big of an impact is that going to have on your midfield um, this season, Kendall? Obviously, Kim Resch has been mentioned already. Joe Linton, I'm, I've, I'm still surprised at how much of a, a turnaround he's had in his career at Newcastle because when he first joined as a striker, I think a lot of Newcastle fans would have had him out the door within a season. Mm. And now he's sort of one of the most sort of established centre midfields in the league at the moment. Yeah, um, the Tonali thing, it's just a little bit frustrating because... Obviously, we're the ones that are, that are going to, as a, a club and as a team, we're the ones that are going to suffer over something that we literally cannot help, um, which is just a little bit frustrating. Obviously, player-wise, he hasn't had he hasn't been here long enough to have as much of an impact as obviously we would have liked to have um, uh, to have had. Um, so luckily, the only thing really that's going to affect us is depth because we've got the extra games this season that we didn't have before and that we haven't had for a number of years now. So that's the or anything luckily it's kind of it's just juxtaposed with the fact that Willock's come back now as well which helps massively um Joel Linton's back from injury we've got a relatively um decent midfield cohort at the moment so it's it's, it's obviously a little bit of a nightmare in terms of if we get any more injuries or anything like that as I say for depth but yeah it's just sad but hopefully I do I do hope he gets the help that he needs I know the club are massively on his side and they're, they're going to support him no matter what um, and get him, you know, the rehab and, and things that he might need. And luckily, um, whether or not people agree or not, he is allowed to train with us. Um, so that is, for our point of view for next season, is massive um, because he's going to keep that sharpness and just being around the team and morale and um, he's not just going to be isolated and sat on the sidelines. So, yeah, that's um, a good thing for us really now. Surprising that he has been allowed to, to mm. train with the squad based on what happened with Ivan Tony, but I'm not going to go into that. That's not my place. What I do with all of our guests uh, in regards to the game week coming up, uh, Eddie, I'll come to you first. Who's your banker for a win this weekend? Look at those fixtures on the left. I mean, Liverpool at home. If you had to, if you had to put your house on it, right? Yeah, it's, it's a fair comment. I think Forrest gave them a good game last season. I think was it three two? It, it, I think Forrest was maybe led maybe once or twice last season when they went to Anfield. Yeah, I mean, if I had to, I mean, Villa at home as well. You'd think you'd think they'd have enough, surely. But then Luton have been scrappy, and uh, and they've been, you know, picking up a couple of points recently. So, but yeah, I'd say Liverpool at home as a banker. Where would your money be, Ozzy? To be honest, Joe, I know it's hard to say because the the Midlands bit, but Villa, to be fair, eleven, I think it is now. Um, eleven wins on a bounce at home. They're just getting it currently. I think they were four 0 up against AZ tonight in the uh, Europa Conference. I think my money would be on Villa, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, Liverpool looks like that, but my money would be on Villa. They're flying at the moment. Um, they're doing really well. Um, so, yeah, it'd probably go there. Based on their form, Ozzy, would a, anything less than them winning the Conference League be a underachievement with the squad that they've got? For Villa, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think they did a bit of a rude awakening on the first game. And since then, he's obviously gone a little bit stronger, which I think you have. Um, I just think, again, he's another manager. You, you know, we talk about people like Eddie Howe. Una Emery was was sort of vilified at, at Arsenal, and then the, the job he's done at um, at Villa's been nothing short of amazing, really, from where he's taken them. And it, you know, Eddie Howe, if you can remember back that long ago, was a bit of a flop at Burnley. Went back to Bournemouth, done what he did at Bournemouth, um, and everyone was sort of not questioning, but it was just it, everyone was a little, bit, a little bit of a strange appointment. I think Kendall will agree when they uh, introduced him at Newcastle. It was almost like, yeah, he's a bit of a stopgap while we sort of fill the gap. Um, while we build this, you know, this 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 work in progress, um, and I think you know a few a few heads have definitely been turned in Newcastle. And like I said, people are people are not quite putting him in the elite bracket, but I think if he wins something, yeah, he certainly will do. You know, he's very close last year to winning a, a trophy, um, and I think that's you know it, it's proof of the pudding. Good managers always get teams doing the right things, and and you're only as good as your manager. Lopetegui last year for Wolves proved that. Um, and again, Gary O'Neill's getting question marks at the moment, isn't he? So um, it's it's a funny one. It's a, it's a strange one. Fans are always a little bit fickle, um, but you know they, 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 those those managers do good jobs. Looking at the league table so far, Kendall, and the way that you've you, you've started the season, nine points. Oh, sorry, nine games, sixteen points. What is what is the objective for Newcastle for you again? Is it is it a top four finish? Um, 
I uh, at the beginning of the season I was kind of on the on the boards of no because I'd had at least t- top six was where I was at because I knew obviously we had the extra Champions League games um I was expecting another decent cup run which I still am at this stage um obviously we've got to get over the hurdles this time because we've had Man City and Man United straight away for our first two fixtures in the Carabao Cup so um we've got to get over those hurdles but getting over Man City was kind of part of the way there so yeah as long as we get a decent cup run and, and at least European football and I would I think if we drop down to conference after being in the Champions League it's going to be a little bit of like a yes we've still kind of progressed from where we were before um but it's going to be a bit like oh, like not great probably across the board for everyone expecting us to to get to Champions League again but yeah I think the league's so strong this year I think it'll have to be we'll be looking at top six obviously top five possibly is going to get Champions League this year so it might change things a little bit but um, yeah top six for me and a, a good cup run I would like to go to a final and obviously win it I'm not saying that I'm expecting to win a trophy but if we do get to a final again I don't want to uh, have to do that horrible journey back, back from Wembley again on a loss so um, yeah decent cup run and top six for me. I ruffled some feathers on on Twitter about a month or so ago. I predicted Newcastle to finish seventh this season, but I actually said they'd get as far as maybe the quarters or the semi-finals of the Champions League. Okay. Um, would, would you take that? Um, yeah, probably because I think I know a lot of people like have this kind of conversation and this debate over whether it would be better for us to win a trophy this year or get as far as we possibly can in the Champions League. And yes, although a trophy would be amazing because it's just it's been like. A, a hump on the back of like Spurs for years and years and they're like oh they've never won anything and obviously I'd like to get that out of the way just so that people can't use that argument towards us but um, I think Champions League just gets you amongst the elite and it gets the players that are interested like no one's going to look at Newcastle if we finish say eighth this season and we've won the Carabao Cup and be like oh I'd love to join Newcastle because we won the Carabao Cup it's just they're just not going to think that and that's just the reality of it if we get to the semi-finals of the Champions League then players that, like elite players are going to be like, oh, actually, yeah, these like can compete at the highest level that I want to play at. So, um, yeah, um, seventh, obviously, depending on fifth, five spots in the Champions League, I don't know if they're going to take sixth and seventh for Europa League this year. I don't know what's going to happen in that way. I, I just don't know if they're going to, like, obviously drag it down to to eighth. So, um, yeah, seventh, if it gets us Europa League, then ideal. If it gets us Conference League, but we get to the semi-finals of the Champions League, then... I'll, I'm not going to lie, I'll probably take it. I'd, I'd lose a finger or a toe to see Wolves back in Europe again. Seeing Wolves play, playing in the Europa League a few years ago was, was the best time of what following Wolves. You talk about football fans being fickle, Aussie. Wolves beat <laughs> Newcastle on Saturday with two points behind Newcastle. Europe's on. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of games left yet. Plenty what's, of games what's, what's the objective still for you? Is it still Wolves to stay up this season? No, I, listen, I don't think... It, it, you're sort of, if you look at the table now, it's almost split into three now, isn't it? If, you, if you're blatantly honest with it, it's very difficult for any club that comes up to financially compete with some of those. Obviously, the ones that sort of bounce up and down. But you look at the table now with what you've got there, it's, it's you know, people will say at the moment it goes to Forest. I, I, I don't see it like that. And then you sort of got that mid table from Forest up to where we are and you know Chelsea may improve. It's so, so difficult to, to sort of look at. You always get one... I wouldn't say shock, but you get someone like a Villa, like a Newcastle at the moment that, that, that push up there. At the moment, it's Spurs, isn't it? Everyone's jumping up and down that Spurs are up in there and sort of taking that place there. I, I just think it's it's such a difficult league because, as you can see, Wolves can go and beat Man City a couple of weeks ago. Uh, teams can beat each other. It's very, very easy to do that. And I think the objective for anybody is to stay in the league. Um, anybody barring the sort of top, sort, top, top eight that you're talking about there, but other than that, anybody else can get dragged into it. Injuries, suspensions, whatever else it is. It can, you, all of a sudden, you start losing games and it's it's not an easy thing to get out of and, and you very quickly can get dragged into that. How happy were you, Eddie, with um, last weekend's uh, away win at Bournemouth? Obviously, we struggled a little bit in the sort of opening period. Uh, managed to pull it back quite instantly after half-time. Bournemouth dropped down to 10 men and Wolves. Edward well word it they sort of orchestrated a light win, but it wasn't it wasn't the easiest win, was it? Well it was I mean, how many times have we seen as a Wolves fan under Nuno where we were ahead, we're on top of a team and we just can't create the opening, we just can't get the winner. You know, we've got all the possession, we can't make it happen in the final third. I mean, obviously you could argue it came from a little bit of an error, but there was the pressing there, Sasha, brilliant pressing to win the ball back, you know, brilliant pass from Wang. 
and then he's in. And uh, you know, it's just so obviously they were de- they were down to ten men, but it was just so refreshing to see Wolves put a team to put a game to bed. You know, get the three points when we're ahead, when we've got a man up, when we've got advantage, when we're playing well, when we're looking good, and actually get the three points. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, brilliant. And obviously, you know, puts us on this run now of four games undefeated, and and as you've been sort of discussing, sort of well outside of that pack at the bottom six of the table. Yeah, what have you made to sort of Wolves' um, start to season? Obviously, obviously, a few players left in the summer. Obviously, key players like Neves, Martino. Raul, Adama, the list, the list goes on. Mateus Cunha is uh, still leading the line. Not really the prolific number nine you've played with in, in, in the past. But have you, have you thought we've fared so far? Like I said, I think the results, obviously nobody expected them to get anything against Ben City. So I think that's a, that's almost like a bonus three points, if that makes sense. I think it's kind of, there was a little bit of doom and gloom. Obviously, over the summer, we're losing the players. The money wasn't invested in the club and, and signings. Um, so there was a little bit of scepticism, I think, going into the season. But I think you'd probably sit in nine games in, sitting where you are, you'd be comfortable that you're happy with where it is. Um, those question marks, again, your point, Gary O'Neill, people, are, you know, you lose the manager who's done so well for you last year. You've got Gary O'Neill. There's a little bit of doom and gloom. I think the result last week was massive um, to give that little bit of boost um, after the sort of international break. But it's it's a strange one. It's They've got results against teams that are kind of almost like free hits. And the, the ones that we're talking about, that mid-table, sort of what you're looking at, up to sort of 14th, they're the ones that you've got to go and win. But again, the fundamentals for this season, for Wolves, if it was, you know, as a fan, you're looking and go, we'd love to be in Europe, we'd love to be doing that. But realistically, with the money and the finances that are happening in the moment, you'd probably take survival again. I mentioned it last week that it's, it's really good to see that Wolves have got players in our forward line for the first time in years that are actually in form instead of it being Jose Sarr or Ruben Neves, Kendall. But um, how have you thought, have you sort of looked upon Wolves this season so far? Yeah, I think obviously a lot of people were uh, writing you guys off at the beginning of the season just because of, of how last season had gone and then the summer and um, obviously the whole managerial change and things like that. But honestly, I think Gary O'Neill's great um i think bournemouth made a mistake and it is it's showing now they made a mistake in getting rid of him so early anyway um so yeah i really like, actually like gary o'neill and wolves have been a team that i've watched to be honest obviously the last two years aside but with envy because you guys played really really good football at times and um seemed to have a decent team and some decent players in that team which you still have so um yeah this season obviously i think the league i know a lot of people were saying last season it's like the weakest league ever but i like completely disagree i genuinely think that um as simon was saying i think there's like you kind of have a section of teams who've been newly promoted um because the gap is widening significantly now between the championship and the premier league and it never used to be like that um coming from experience obviously we've played in the championship before um and i think there's a there's those teams and then Obviously, a little midsection of teams, a couple of teams have dropped down to there now who I wouldn't have expected to um, be kind of fighting for survival every year now, like yourselves, like like Everton. Um, and then obviously you've got the, the top. But I think there's like eight or so teams now who for the top eight, which I've never seen so close for a long time. It's always been like, you know, like the big six and it's normally been four of them have been really, really good and top four every year. So, yeah, um, but I think... I've never been to the Molyneux. I really wish I could go this year. That, I, I wanted to do the Molyneux away this year, but it's my daughter's party on Saturday. Um, birthday party. <laughs> didn't plan that out very well, did I? But I did plan it 12 till 2 so I could watch the game, which, you know, I had to had to plan it somewhere. <laughs> but it's plenty pretty much drinking yeah. time in there after 2 o'clock. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it's been a tough place for us to go the last few years. There's been a lot of draws in there. So, um, yeah, I don't expect it to be any any different this weekend, really. Yeah, a lot of draws have happened in in recent years. Uh, one of the questions we did have on Twitter earlier, Kendall, was why was the two one defeat mm. uh, a couple of years ago so um, disheartening for you? Yeah, do you know what it was? Nothing to do with like Wolves or anything, or because I thought we were going to win. It was because obviously that was the game before the takeover, um, and at that point we hadn't had a win. You guys got your first win, and I just could not at that point see where we were getting a win from, and I was like, 
oh yeah that's it we're, we're gone this year I, I just I honestly had it in my my head that we were gone and I was like I don't know when we're going to come back because obviously at this point the takeover was not on the horizon because that was done within 48 hours we had no idea five days later it was going to be completely different fortunes for us um so yeah I just think a lot of us had never felt as low because we always had hope and as a football fan it is the hope that kills usually but we'd always had hope and just at that point I was on my way back from um we'd went we'd been at the pub to watch that game and me and my dad we just didn't speak to each other at all like we just didn't speak in the, the whole time in, in on the journey back because I was just like I can't even I don't even have the energy to like to speak <laughs> about the game like it was just it was just horrible and I've honestly never even when we've been relegated before like the first relegation was tough, but I was young, so I just kind of got over it. But um, the second relegation, we had Rafa, so I was like, oh, we'll be fine. Like, we've, we've got Rafa Benitez, so we're absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, that was just, it was tough. And I just, at that point, didn't see any, any way back from us. But yeah, we just, I don't know what was looking down on us at that point, but uh, we managed to, to hit the jackpot really a few days later. Look how far you've come there. If you have a look at the uh, predicted lineups there on the right, um, I think it's going to be a case of who can outscore who on Saturday, uh, Anthony Gordon, Callum Wilson, Almiron probably leading the line for Newcastle. Obviously, Wolves up front with a front three of Pedro Neto, Mateus Cunha and Huang. Uh, looking at the, the players that are coming back from suspension, Eddie, uh, Nelson Samado and Mario Lamina, uh, you'd suspect that Samado will come instantly back in for Doherty, who had a supposed groin strain before the Bournemouth game. Would you have Bubakar Traore in at centre midfield or does Jao Gomez next to Lamina uh, be the, the route for you? Well, I mean, yeah, as you, as you, as you say, Semedo's um, a huge return for us. He's been one of my players of the season. I think one of most Wolves fans' player of the season so far. Um, and Mary Lamina, again, uh, a solid, um, experienced head in the middle of the park. I think Troy maybe done enough. Um, I think he's been, we've really needed him. Um, and he's he's been a quality player for us. Although, interestingly enough, although you might, you might, um, uh, talk about this in a little time. The Monday night football appearance from Gary O'Neill talked about the midfield battle um, against uh, uh, Bournemouth and how that went. I, I thought the first half we were getting that wrong, and I thought Chirore was was sitting deep enough, and he, we sort of needed him in that Lamina position. So I think it'll be huge having Lamina back because the way he reads the game, the way he positions himself in the midfield is is vital for us, and we really missed that first half against Bournemouth. Um, Ozzy, looking at the, the Wolves lineup there, is there any sort of possibility? I mean, you, you can't really change a, a formation on the back of four unbeaten, can you? You wouldn't have thought so, but as you as again, you just alluded to there, Eddie, it's Gary O'Neill was obviously a deep thinker about you know changing stuff. Eddie Howe, very much similar uh, manager, they'll take each game individually and they'll plan out the, the game plan to beat a team. You look at that, and instantly you can see where the battles are going to come from. You've got a midfield three of potentially Newcastle going against that. So it's going to be it's going to be a tough one. You know, they'd work at it, they'd look at it. And um, as I said, we're, we're guessing. We're guessing that those are the two teams that are going to come out there. You know, if Eddie Howe's seen something like Gary O'Neill has and, and feels there's an element of somewhere he can get at Wolves, he may well change that. You know, it, it, that's the beauty now of football when, you know, everything's videoed, everything's you know, the training sessions are videoed. It's so, so different from, from back in my day. Not that I'm that old, by the way. Um, we did have phones just about and we did have video. But, <laughs> you know, that, that stuff is, is it was a great insight from Gary. Fortunately, I played with Gary a long, long time ago and he doesn't live too far from me now. Um, and he came on loan at Walsall. But, you know, that's the detail now that football has gone to. That 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 tiny little detail of videos. <coughs> excuse me. And, and both of those managers will be looking at it. Gary's a young up-and-coming manager very similar to coming out of a, a plane to be a manager to where Eddie is now. So it'd be, it'd be interesting. And like I said to you, obviously there's some, there's some matchups that are going to be fun. Obviously if Samedo does come back in, Anthony Gordon's been, you know, again, people questioned him going to, to, uh, to Newcastle, but he's been, Eddie's got the best out of him and he's been fantastic. Consider, don't forget, this was the kid that came off and everybody was going mad at when he almost chucked his dummy out the pram, didn't he? When he, when he got took off, and look what he's doing now. You know that that shows good man management skills for the manager, and, and and he's bringing the best out of him. So that'd be that'd be interesting. Samedo's just come back from injury. You know that's that's a that's a big battle down that side. Neto gives you a hell of a lot going forward. Is he going to be asked to do a little bit more defensively? So that, you know, there's the matchups there. Burn, Dan Burn, 
you know, people will say he's not blessed with a great pace, but he doesn't get beat very often, does he? No, Adama Traore caused him a lot of problems when he was at Brighton, Dan Byrne, but I don't really remember Adama creating a, an assist for a, for a goal. I think Dan Byrne, he got Dan Byrne in the book a, a few times, but like I said, he isn't, he doesn't look the fastest, but he's obviously got long leg strides, so he, he is able to keep up for the majority of wingers. You look along that left side for, for Newcastle, Anthony Gordon and, and Dan Byrne coming up against um, Neto and Samado. That's going to be an area I think Wolves will be hoping to exploit. But you've mentioned uh, Kieran Trippier not having a, a good game uh, last night, uh, Kendall. Where else could Wolves exploit Newcastle on Saturday? Um, To be fair, defensively, it's probably our... Um, I know we've scored the most goals in the league, but defensively like we're just so strong we have been now under Eddie for a long time um my only issue is obviously with Trippier not having the best of games um yesterday I don't know how he's gone that's highly unusual from though like genuinely so unusual he's never ever normally below an eight out of ten like at, at any point so um for him not to have the best game he's obviously going to be trying to, to kind of resurrect that on um on Saturday so yeah, it's tough because I think actually it's gonna be it's gonna to be to our detriment us with the way Wilson played yesterday because when I watched him I was like he's just not he's not match fit at all, um he's not fresh he's not he's not someone that I watch and believe that he can get him even though he scores a lot what judging from yesterday I was like oh, I'm actually dreading now how he's going to last five ninety minutes because obviously as I've said Isaac's now out for probably around five games till the next international break so. That's concerning me significantly. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what is um, going to happen. And honestly, I think a lot of teams will come and be like, oh, we're going to exploit Dan Byrne. Because I think I've seen it a lot. I've seen his side be targeted a lot. And honestly, again, he's another player. He's just so rarely let us down. Even yesterday, we were poor, but it wasn't him. He wasn't poor. He was fine. He was, he was solid once again. He was absolutely fine. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how you guys approach this game um because i honestly think it's going to be us that lets us down um rather than us going there and kind of not expecting you to do anything it's going to be us that lets us down so yeah it'll be interesting to see considering you guys have been really solid this season i think um and gary o'neill set up the system pretty well what how you approach this game at home because um, I think it's obviously a good opportunity for you, especially when we played yesterday. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. I think the uh, pubs around Wolverhampton will be uh, the bar staff will be uh, uh, sort of <laughs> they'll be they'll be working tirelessly on on, yeah. on Saturday. Um, Wolves need to start the game quickly, don't they, Aussie? I think Newcastle still being without Sven Botman is an area that Wolves will be will be looking to exploit. Obviously, Shaw and Lascelles are re a really um, solid established Premier League defenders, but. If we can get our front three, um, Wang, Cunha and Neto sort of working closely together, they have got pace, uh, pace to get in behind. Yeah, I mean, he's a big miss, isn't he? Botman, you know, most of the teams in the top six there would take him without that. He's been he's been fantastic. But again, you're sort of looking at that and I, I still think, although they're going to try, and, I think it's the midfield. I think the midfield battle will be where it's won. Um, if you can get enough ball to Huang and Neto in decent in decent areas, I think that's where it's going to be sort of give or take. I take Kendall's point. Wilson just, I think, like I said, he he, he never looks truly fit, does he? You know, he yes. sort of comes in. He, it, listen, he's a great goal scorer. He's, he's done brilliant. But again, he's sort of one of them. I think that, that Kilman Dawson, they can deal with that. You know, they're both, you know, pretty experienced. Dawson's pretty decent in what he does. I think, I don't think they'll be as worried about playing against Wilson, if that makes sense, as they would against Isaac. And that's a, a, a bit of a loss. That's how I see it anyway. Um, Almiron's been brilliant again, again, since under Eddie Howe. Again, people were questioning what he was doing. I just think it's so important, the midfield the midfield area. If Juarez gets control of the game, he can run the whole game. That's how I see it. And if he does that, um, it'll be very surprising. I sort of look at it sometimes, and I actually think that at some point, Eddie Howe will play Gordon up front. I really do, if, if yeah. you're missing that. You've got pace with him up there. It, it, it's sort of that false ninety type thing, isn't it? He can play him up there. Um, obviously, I don't know. Listen, that's why I'm not a manager anymore and these guys do it. But um, <laughs> as a player, you know, coming into games like that, it, it, the midfield battle allows the, the forward players to go and express themselves. And I think that's where it's going to be 
critical in this game, especially to allow the people like your Gordons, like your Almirons, like Joel Linton getting forward. They're, that's where it's going to be won and lost. And if we can get, and if Newcastle come out on top, they'll be providing. If Wolves can get a joy like they did last week against the Bournemouth, Neto and Huang get more ball. It's as simple as that, really, for me. Um, both teams are not blessed with what I would say an out and out goal scorer, Wilson to a point. I think that's, you know, if, if people had the money to do it, I'm sure Newcastle would go out in the January transfer window and go, go and, and get a centre forward without doubt. But they are so hard to come by because there's so much money um, and it's not easy to attract players to, to anywhere if they're sitting somewhere and, and, and not really playing. And if they're not playing, why they're not playing? You know, who would you go and get? Who would you go? Who, would do, who could Newcastle, where everyone says they've got loads and loads of money? Great. Who can you go and buy right now? Who is a feasible yeah. striker for you, Kendall? I think you you would struggle, um, to be That's honest. A, Getting a, a, to get a quality one who's willing to rotate, um, as Simon says, it's just one of those things because obviously we've got Wilson's not going to want to go anywhere considering the return he's had. He's now like what, one of our top five goal scorers ever. Also, I, I don't know top five, but it's definitely like a in the quite Premier League, number. Yeah, in the yeah Premier League. he overtook Les Ferdinand the other week, didn't he? Yeah, he's all, and he took overtook Shaw Lamiobi just against Crystal Palace. So, um, he like we, he's not going to want to go anywhere. Obviously, Isaac's young, and I would like to think that we have a, a good few years left of him at Newcastle. It's just obviously same fit, and yeah, it's it's tough because I think a striker and a DM are just such difficult positions to buy because the market is so high for them. Mm. Um, it's just, it's like a struggle, and Eddie obviously likes a versatile player usually. So, as a Gordon, for example, um, as we've said, he can play as like an, he can play centrally if he needs to. So, I can't even I wouldn't even know who we would go for it genuinely in January. I, I actually genuinely don't know because the likes of Watkins, he's fine at Aston Villa, and um, we're not going to go back for Ivan Tony because that's just we just I don't think we would. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's just it's a strange one to be fair. Uh, Griezmann, Simon. that's what I would like. Griezmann, Griezmann is who I would, I would like. But I, I, he's gonna, yeah. yeah, yeah. But he's gonna, um, he'll, he'll retire at, at Atleti now. So, yeah, I think uh, that might be. <laughs> yeah, he has got a bond with Newcastle, hasn't he? After that football manager video that he posted yeah. a few years ago when he signed him. <laughs> exactly. Mbappe. Um, Simon did mention it just there, dear, about um the midfield where it's probably going to be won on, on Saturday. Is there a, a possibility that Gary could go back to a back four with um? With Kilman and Dawson, and I'm, I'm using Totti as an example here, and going to a four-three-three and matching them up. I know you could probably well, say no, but I thought I'd give you the option just to give me reason why not. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, like you said before, Dan, I don't think uh, he can really change anything based on the four games we've had. Uh, I mean, the other option, of course, is is a is a is, um, yeah, moving someone like Cunha to the bench. Could you believe and and putting three in midfield that way? Uh, you know. Playing a uh, Triore, Lamina, and Jao Gomez, but I don't see him tinkering with the system we've got now. Other than possibly um, having someone like a like a Kilman playing a bit further forward, or, or uh, and, and and maybe filling filling those gaps. But I don't see any experimentation in in a home game against a tough team when when we've been doing well against teams like Villa, against teams like Man City. You know, these are teams that are you know banging in you know four or five goals, uh, and they're getting uh, yeah one against us, and and we're turning them over. So, you know, I, I can't see us changing that system. Uh, Morpeth Wolves is saying four and a half hour drive down on Saturday for the big game of the season. Have to beat Newcastle. Um, How can he your... be from Morpeth supporting Wolves? That's wrong. That's he wrong. Moved. It's in North, it's in North he could have moved. He I'll take moved. it. If he, I'll take it if you've moved. I'll take he it. He could have moved. moved. <laughs> it is uh, really tough for you to accept, Kendall. But we're just a bigger club than you. I know. I know. You've got That's bigger fan a base. But bigger, we're just a bigger fans club. in Morpeth now. <laughs> That's it. We, we, we're all over the world. Morpeth, Marbella. <laughs> Bill Stone, we're all over the place. <laughs> what is your score prediction for Saturday, Kendall? So, I honestly think it's going to be a very tough game. I think it's probably going to be one of our um, toughest tests so far, obviously, especially because we're away. If we were at home again, I would have not been confident, but I would have been like, OK, I think we, we can go and win. But I think it's genuinely going to be a really, really tough game. Obviously, we really need to keep hot on the heels of everybody else around us. So, we really need to win again on Saturday. And coming from yesterday, usually we have... If we've lost, we usually have a really pretty good game afterwards. Um, just simply because Eddie Howe's mentality and the way that he coaches the players and stuff, they don't like to be 
down and dwell on things for too long. So, yeah, I think it's going to be tough, but I'm going to back us to win. That's not, I don't do that very often, by the way, even though we are, we have been good because I'm always like totally worried that we don't win and then I'm disappointed. I'd rather just expect the worst and uh, <laughs> and not be as disappointed. But I'm going to go 2-1 Newcastle. That's what I'm going to do um, and hope that I'm right. <laughs> no, whether I believe or not is, is a different story, but that's what I'm hoping, hoping for. Yeah, whether you're right or not, that's exactly the score prediction that Paul Merson has predicted for Saturday's game. Newcastle to win 2-1. Uh, Does Paul where... Merson often have a good take, though? Like, you know, football related? You, um... All I'm saying you is that. you've got the same mindset you as Paul Merson. I could tell you about that. I was his, I was his assistant for a little bit, so I could tell you about that. So. Has he, uh, what? what... Is he got a good take? Usually, I don't mind him as a person. It just no, he's got, listen. But honestly, again, as we, we talk about obviously Tonali and then, and obviously Paul Merson's well yes. publicised. He had an issue with gambling and whatever else. So, um, he, to be fair, I really liked what he said because he went completely against the grain of everybody else, and he was really heartfelt yeah. in what he was saying. I think that was really good in what he said. To be fair, yeah, listen, from... you know, obviously, I was I played with Paul at Warsaw and, and they helped him out on the management side of it. So. He's that is genuine. That's not him just yeah. saying that for the sake of saying that. Obviously, he's had a lot of issues with the the, the gambling and whatever else, and obviously drinking and, and stuff like that. So it's it you know it's a disease. It's it's a fact. It is a disease, and you know much as he's made mistakes, he's been punished for it. You know he, this guy's now going to miss the rest of this season. He has no chance if Italy go to the Euros of being involved in that. So that's a massive as a football player but myself. That's like you know you're. You're taking what, what what we love. So he's made his mistake. He's been punished. He's been caught out. It's what it is. It's done. Support him. You know, go and crucify and vilify the guy. What's he going to do next? You know, it's, it's not the way forward. It's not the way forward. He's made a yeah. mistake. It's done. Yeah, obviously he's been, he's been punished. He'll, he'll regret it now. Um, obviously, big loss for Newcastle. Do you feel there's been any sort of dirtiness played by Milan in the actual sale, Kendall, at all? Um, I'm honestly not sure. Like the reports are saying that they didn't know. Obviously, they're going to say that they're going to say well, we didn't know. But um, I think as far as we are being told tonight, he's kept it really, really secret um, of what, what he's been doing and stuff. But it does obviously make you look at the transfer differently because it was well publicised at the time when we went for him because we'd actually gone to Italy for Barella um, and Inter said that Barella's at, at, at no chance is he for sale and um, there's no deal to be done there. And then we were actually approached by Tonali's agent to say there might be a deal to be done there. So that was already fishy. And then we were like, that's really weird because we'd been in from before behind the scenes because it was Eddie Howe's number one target. That's who he wanted, actually, Tonali. Um, and then obviously they, them approaching us now looks weird like it looks like why would you do that like because obviously no one was expecting that transfer like boyhood ac milan fan probably going to be the captain one day like italy under 21s so uh under 23 sorry so yeah it was a bit it looked it looks a bit weird now looking back on it but apparently if reports are to be, to be believed we are going to go down a lawsuit route so whether or not that uncovers anything i i don't know but it's us that's suffering at the end of the day which is just <laughs> annoying but um i don't blame it on him because as i say um, and as Simon rightly said, it is a disease, and I do hope he gets the rehab that he needs to to recover, and the club will be behind him. But yeah, we're uh, on the on the wrong end of the stick, basically now. Yeah, it's unfortunate. There's just so many betting markets available today compared to when when you played Simon. It's, it, it is hard to avoid a bet when the, when there's advertisements on the telly every five minutes. You got um, Sky Bet giving Player of the Month awards. It's like players are, are thrusting the gambling culture wherever they look, and then the it's, it is difficult to avoid. Uh, Kendall's gone for 2 1 Newcastle, Eddie. What is, where's your money for Saturday night? Well, uh, I mean, what Gary O'Neill's kind of guaranteeing uh, recently is is goals, uh, both for, for and against. Uh, for our last seven games, we've scored and conceded, I believe. Um, so I think 1 1 is probably a sensible prediction. I'm going to go 1 all. Yeah, uh, like I said, we've got so many draws against Newcastle in recent years. It wouldn't surprise me if we go down that route. Jonathan Broom has commented, great drill, top Eddie. Uh, it, is a, it is a proper old school. You can't beat the, nut, the nutmeg kits. I think I've got the the, the old the, the nutmeg kit behind me there. It's Eddie's got some impressive... I love the nutmeg era. Um, what, what is that? Just that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's about 94. <laughs> that's your era, isn't it, Ozzy? That's when you... Roughly, when you yeah. That, I so didn't this have was, that. Yeah. 94, so this was, 95... 
yeah exactly yeah yeah this is this is 94 um, yeah. when when that when that makes started making our kits mm -hmm. um but and a conversation for later on but i'd love to hear about if you've got any training kits left over or or any shirts i never had training those. kits i don't know I, most of the stuff obviously i had back then i don't i don't have a lot i never collected shirts particularly i got i gave a lot away to charity at the time um we never had training kits no didn't i didn't really get anything like that I don't even know what I've got, if I'm honest with you. I never collected stuff. Not not for any reason. I just I just didn't well, I think, didn't I think... have the TV money then, did they to have like the amount of like kits the guys have now? They've all got like four hundred pairs each, haven't they? It's Listen, you you see why so much kit gets ends up in like charity shops now because it's you, just you used to have I mean... to drive to the training ground, get changed to the ground, drive to the training ground where it is now. So a little bit different. It's all right. It's good. I mean, that's that's the that's that's why I love you know eighty shirts, ninety shirts. You know, back then the the kit man would have you know you you tell me, Aussie, but my understanding is the kit man would have a you know handful of shirts, two or three shirts for the season, and that was it. Whereas these days, players have three shirts for every match, unless yeah. you're a player like Leo Messi, when you've got fifty shirts for every match, yeah. just so you've got so many to give away to all the staff and and other team that want them. Um, but you know, back back when you you know like. It's a, it's a long story, but I, I've got behind me, Ozzy, some of my favourite match shirts from um, from back in the day. Um, you'll remember this one, of course. Yeah, it's what? probably the same size. They had one size fits all, and I'm not yeah. the biggest fella in the world, and it probably <laughs> was about eight sizes too big. Yeah, only XL, only XL for the players. Yeah, that, that, that V-neck was basically down by my navel. <laughs> I did want to ask you about that because you all you you always used to wear like an underlayer, didn't you? Always, yeah, just did, yeah. I sweat. Um, so you you I felt the cold or something? No, I no, I, I, it's nothing. To, I love the cold. It's nothing. I sweat so much. It's just you only had, like I said, you only had one shirt. It wasn't you could change it. I sweated a lot, so I changed my undershirt at half time, not the overshirt. That's the only reason I did it. And and this one because uh... I run around, I just sweat a lot. I just just to put that into it. <laughs> It wasn't the work ethic. I just sweated a lot. <laughs> well, you could say something on the end of that. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Just to oh, say, yeah, and th this is you'll you'll know you'll know who who were uh, what were the number four um, back in those days, Ozzy. Okay. Who's could four? you could you tell me? Four. Big four, four. big player. Yeah, it could have been. I'm just trying to think. In four at ninety five, ninety six. With the long with the long sleeves. Oh, I'd have gone for someone like Mark Atkins. No, Atco did where Atco was around. He's got it. He's got it. Was there. I was going to say it could have been Mark Atkins. Yeah, Mark Atkins. Richard was six. Atco was yeah. four. That's right. Yeah. And, well, and I'm, yeah, I'm going to get couple... Kendall back involved oh, for a quick second sorry. before, before we right? go for the evening. <laughs> what's your What's your favourite Newcastle kit um, retro wise? Oh, um, mine's probably round the round about the same era. Um, I loved our away. Uh, obviously the classic navy and burgundy striped kit um, that was just elite obviously we're getting adidas back next season as well which is lovely because <laughs> i really hope they bring back those types of kits because the, even the home one the one that i am um, it's like my i say lucky but i wore it last night so actually that's not anymore um it's the the one with the shield numbers on the back um i think that was na possibly 95 96 ish roughly around that time so yeah that's my favorite them my favorite ones so i'm hoping adidas bring them back because puma did try and do the um burgundy and navy one about two or three years ago when we had puma still and uh we've got it actually be four years ago now but yeah it wasn't uh just wasn't as good i just like i just like the retro kits the quality like the styling the shape of them just so so much better than the than the modern kits i think Newcastle have had some brilliant, brilliant kits over the years, especially like you say, the Burgundy one. Just think of Ginola with a big kind of almost 3D writing on the back, like brilliant shirt. And I mean, with Newcastle, obviously, you know, the big thing, like you say, is Adidas. And the other big thing is Newcastle Brown Ale. Come on, how would you love yeah. to see Newcastle Brown Ale on the front again? I know, I, the, I would I love it. It's probably blue, iconic, isn't it? <laughs> the blue Newcastle away kit in the early 90s. I think it was like McEwen's may have been in the sponsor. I remember Andy Cole playing in that kit. I think yes. that was that was smart kit back in the time. Kendall, thank you for joining us on the Wolves Fancast tonight. Really appreciate you giving up your time. Hopefully, <coughs> we'll get you back on for the uh, return fixture and your score prediction for Saturday is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect nothing less from you, Dan. I wouldn't expect nothing less. And to be honest... I might be wrong, but it is what it is. I'm wrong about a lot of things. So, 
Thank you, Kendall. No, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Right, Cheers we're going to be yeah, having a quick audio break for our podcast network all day, and then we're going to be talking about Ozzy's career at Wolves. <laughs> Whilst well, Ozzy's gone for a quick um, run around his living room, get his stretches in, Eddie. Um, I'm going to the you... toilet. Don't yeah, you, 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 go, you, go, you go to the toilet. We'll, 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 we'll fill in without you. Hit um, me down. It, Eddie, um, yeah, last week's win, 2-1 away at Bournemouth. was an important three points, but let's talk about your shirt collection a few more minutes while uh, we wait for Ozzy to return. You've got the uh, the white Puma in the background. You've got the same wall shirt that I've got me behind behind me there what have you had uh new to your collection recently well these are i mean these are some classics to be fair uh, this drill top is uh one of the more recent things i've got a shout out to um john john paul uh, another another collector um uh, uh wolves collector runs a facebook group uh, with me where, where we where people sort of sell wolf shirts and, and get help selling shirts and he actually he, he managed to get this one i think it is actually a player issue um drill top and and i mean you i mean i know you've got i know you've got a 92 i want to say it's like a like a like a drill top track or a jacket top, yeah. yeah track top and he loved that leisure stuff because it's just so hard to find so hard to find in good condition in adult sizes you know and when you find like a great piece of leisure wear from the mid 90s you just can't beat it I'm not sure if you saw it on, I don't know whether it was on John Paul's Facebook page or it may have been yours, but I, I bought another track top the other day, the yellow and black Bukta um, from around the same era. Um, I bought it in a, in a medium size for £35. I looked on eBay and someone bargain. was trying to sell it for £120. I was, uh, I was busy at the time, but bargain. medium adults, I'm, I'm struggling with, even with a jumper on, so that might be... Uh, on my well, if you, if you want to move it on, Dan, just let me know. Thirty-five pounds, I'll uh, I'll take off your hands. Yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> I, I have been tempted to a few mates, but uh, yeah, like you said, it's uh, I think it, it it's it may be before that track top that you was on about. I think it might be like ninety ninety one time. Um, but I, I, I thought tried. Bring, uh, I sort of thought I'd bring some kits from you know from from uh, Aussie's era. Um, so I brought yeah. you know because you because you, you, you joined us in was it ninety five. Yeah, I was, that wasn't mine. <clears throat> so this was wasn't no, this wasn't your shirt with the long with the long yeah. sleeves. But no, that you... was the year before me. I think not yeah. Oh, I was think it? I joined. <clears throat> what did I joined ninety five, ninety six. Yeah, I looked earlier. December ninety five. You joined. Yeah, I didn't realise how bad that first sort of six months was for you at Wolves because we only just scraped relegation, didn't we? Yeah, it was tough. Like I said, obviously Graham Taylor got sacked and Mark McGee come in, and there, there was a, sh- a hell of a lot of players there. Um, not playing very well. Uh, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough sort of six months when I signed there from December through to just, I think we finished about, I think it was 16th or something in the end or something stupid like that. From talked about from the year before, obviously, because I was at uh, Reading the year before um, and you obviously got beat by Bolton the year before in the playoffs. Um, and it went from that to where it was the following season. I obviously went to QPR, via QPR to Wolves um, and Wolves were really struggling. But when you looked at the squad, the squad was amazing. Yeah. I looked, I think he was like, I don't think, I think we didn't win for something like two months in the March, March and April. March I remember April. I think it, it was 11 games or something like that. I didn't think we got a win for about 11 games. We just plummeted badly. I mean, this is, so what, what year would that be? 95? 96. I'd have been eight years old, going mm. to Charlton, last game of the season. Glenn Crow scores an equaliser. That's how far we're going back. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, and then obviously the I'm next season, now, yeah, we're, we're all getting there. So I mean, <laughs> I, I, what, what's just for the for the fans who aren't aware of your time at Wolves? Obviously, we got a lot. Of, I mean, we had we've got a lad on our podcast who's like twenty, so he was like, he weren't even born when you were for at Wolves. But for the players that the people that don't know you, how how proud is it for you to play for a club like Wolves? Because I, I went to to Compton the other week. For a charity seven aside, and the facility there now is just mm. unreal. But you just, I don't think people sometimes realise how big Wolves are as a club. I'm not saying Man United, Liverpool size, but we we are a big club, aren't we? Yeah, like I said, obviously I've been at Palace uh, all my career as an apprentice and all the way through. Then went to Reading. We missed out, obviously getting promoted the, the season before. I then went to QPR as a Premier League club, um, and M- Mark McGee took over. And then coming up to Wolverhampton, it's like, it's for me, it's a, it's a big move. But getting up there, that's the stadium, 
the setup, the way the fans were. For me, it was it was a no-brainer for me to move to a club. I perceived it as a big club, a sleeping giant. Everyone talked about the sleeping giant in that time. And for me, it was a it was a big club, a good stadium. Obviously, the facilities were starting to be built, but it wasn't quite up to that. But now they're a big club with a history, you know. So it was it was a great move for me. I love my time at Wolves. My, both my children are born in, in, in Wolverhampton, effectively. So um, I spent an awful lot of time there, came back to London and then moved back up to Walsall. So the West Midlands for me, I, you know, I loved it up there. And it was a, it, it's different because it's very much um, a big club within a small community, if that makes sense. It's not a big, it's not a big city. I've obviously grown up in London where you can walk around the corner and not be noticed by anybody. And all of a sudden it was a, a very much a goldfish bowl. The The town loves winning. Um, you know, being in the Premier League, we didn't, um, under my time, we never quite made it. Dave Jones did slightly after me. Um, and that was always the, the sort of holy grail, getting back into the Premiership, getting back to those good old days. And and when Wolves won and you went out on a Saturday night or you was going something to eat, the town was happy. If they didn't, it was a, it was a, a little bit of a different place. So, yeah, massive, massive club. Um, changed a lot, but football's changed a lot. Yeah, you, everything literally is buzzing in Boston, isn't it? When Wolves are winning, you, yeah. You mentioned sort of going out on a Saturday night. What what were the sort of bars that you would have frequented back then? Oh, what of bars? There, Light Bar was one back in the day. That was one David Platt used to run, wasn't it? So he had something to do. With it. There was another bar I can't even remember it in um, in the centre of town, but the name's gone out of my brain. Can't even remember. And like, but we didn't. We'd only stay. So I was living locally, um, so we'd sort of stay that way. Um, Every now and then you go to Birmingham, but not not frequently. Um, so we'd stay in Wolverhampton. Were you one of, of the old a lot that um, took Robbie Keane out when he was only seventeen? Probably, <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah. Robbie was a young lad. Obviously, Robbie, I remember it. Rob, Robbie scored two goals against Norwich. That that was his sort of debut. I was sitting in hospital having my knee operated on the same day, so it was. Um, he's a great player, great player, good lad, great player. You already mentioned it earlier, played with Gary O'Neill um, at Warsaw 20 years ago this week, Simon. Yeah. Ready nil, Warsaw won, and some serious old school Wars players were playing that game. Marcus Hanneman, A.D. Yeah. Williams for Warsaw, yourself, Neil Emblen, um, Vinny Samways, and you mentioned Gary O'Neill, 20 years old at the time. Yeah. Did you foresee him becoming a manager at then? I mean, he, he wasn't there very long, was he? No, you, you, listen, at that, that, that age, you wouldn't have looked at him. He wouldn't have, all he'd been worried about was trying to get into to the first team. He was at Portsmouth, I think, and he came to us on loan. Um, so, no, people like that, you don't look at, it, at people of being, you know, um, you've got a picture there of me and Neil Emblem. Neil, you wouldn't have seen Neil at the time going into coaching, and he's forged out a great career for himself over in New Zealand, done some work with the All Whites, then gone over to, to Colorado Rapids, and, and he's got a great career in coaching. You wouldn't have seen Neil at the same time doing that. Um, so it's 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 a strange one. You would you have seen him? As you get older, you start thinking about it. Obviously, I wanted to do it. I was assistant and bits and pieces of coach of Walsall, but it didn't quite work out. So you, you you go down different paths. Would I have liked to stay in football? Of course I would. Why wouldn't you? It's, it's something I've played and loved all my life. And if I could have got a job at the time, I would have done it. But um, it wasn't to be. Walsall at the time, you know, I interviewed, didn't quite get the job after a poor person left. And, and they went a different direction. And then I sort of moved back to, to London and, you know, I managed at non-league and played, but it's it's not quite the same. Um, one of the people in our WhatsApp group earlier when I actually shared that picture, uh, obviously Colin Lee was the manager for Warsaw that day. And it appears it's a three seven zero formation. Can you try and put it together who was up front that day? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we, we're very fortunate. I, I was, at, I, I, I'd left... And gone back to Gillingham, back home. Home, I say home. I moved back down to, to London. Um, and then Colin Lee, uh, I had a bit of a fallout with the chairman at Gillingham. I might cut a long story short. I snapped my Achilles tendon. Um, lots of things have gone on. There's there's too many stories. And is Colin, that from Paul that, Stanley, or is, is yeah, it yeah, yeah. That, listen, I, st- I speak to Paul now. It's just one of those things that happens in football. That's ITV money went a bit bandy. It all went a bit pear shaped. I'd signed. Um, I'd left Walsall, went to play, uh, left Wolves, sorry, went to Tramway on uh, a permanent deal to the end of the season, got messed about by an agent, didn't have a club, basically. I didn't have a football club. Um, so I'd gone from being effectively Wolves club captain to within six months uh, not playing. 
I then signed for Port Val under Brian Horton, played there and then signed for Gillingham and back in the championship, all because an agent basically didn't do what he said he was going to do. So I basically reneged on a contract at Tranmere. Too many stories, it's gone and then ended up at Gillingham. Was going to sign there, signed for two seasons with a, an option. Didn't come there. So Colin Lee sort of said, look, I've got this project. I'm going to Walsall. Blah, blah, blah. There's a couple of players I'm going to sign after you. You know, it'd be great. And we signed, I think the week after I signed, we signed Paul Merson and Vinnie Sandways. Um, so there was, you know, we were, to tell you that story of that season, there was, we were, I think we beat Cardiff away on Boxing Day and we were fifth and got relegated. Yeah, that's that's, that's classic Warsaw. I was on BBC WM the other week talking out of all the teams in the Midlands, Warsaw are probably the most value for money for entertainment because you've got no idea what's going to happen with that club. No, they got, yeah, they got beat 4 0 by bottom of the league the other week, and then I think yeah. they beat one of the, the, the challenges uh, last yeah. week. Uh, it's a balmy club, but this is uh, obviously the Wolves fan cast. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about. Um, I posted the pictures earlier. Uh, you can see there some absolute players you've come up against in, in Wolves. Mark Overmars, Lewis Figo, Paul Gascoigne. Some really tough fixtures. What sort of memories have you got playing against those players, specifically like Lewis Figo on that day, scoring against Barcelona, I believe? I yeah, I mean, only a friendly, but you still got to beat him, haven't you? Yeah, listen, it, it, that was a pre-season friendly, but it, it, it was, you know, every game you're sort of coming up against great players, you know, you sort of look at this. It looks like, see, look, I said about their shirts. You see what I said, Eddie? See the size of that shirt on the right hand side? <laughs> Awful. Um, yeah, that, was a shock, that was a shocking neckline, to be honest. No, I mean, it was, you know, that's what you, as a footballer, that was what you wanted to do. You wanted to play. I, I was fortunate enough to play in the Premier League. Um, coming at Wolves, I was fortunate to come up against some good, we, you know, at that at that time, there were some some good footballers in the, in the what was so-called the Championship. Um and to get sometimes to play against the Overmars in the FA Cup and Figo in a pre-season friendly, you know, uh, we played Chelsea, I think, one one pre-season, I think, um, as well at home. That was, that, for me, that was... I've coming up against Le Boeuf and Di Matteo. That of, that's uh, a, exactly that, yeah. So that was that was great for me. I, I tasted it in the Premier League and I've said on, on, on other podcasts I've done before, I played in the Premier League, but I wasn't a Premier League player. So there's there's a difference. Um, my level was probably championship. That was my level with the greatest respect to, to you know, I was a good footballer. I'm not going to lie to forget where I was. You know, that's not be, me being humble, but there's a difference the levels you go to and playing against them. It was, for, I was fortunate to play against those kind of players uh, and to be able to see him. Gaza was a little bit more on the decline, but still a great player. I'd played against him at Tottenham when I was 17, 18, sorry. And, you know, I'm just lucky to have been, to be able to play with those against those players and to play with some of the players I played with. Definitely. Is there a is there a player that's that stood out against you that's always been an absolute terror? There's there's always been one player for me when he's ever come up against Wolves, Sean Wright Phillips. He's not like the most biggest name in the football world, but whenever Sean Wright Phillips played against mm. Wolves, he absolutely terrorised us. Is there a player for you like that? Uh not not one in particular, but it was always players that always done well against us, you know, like from someone like Richie Wellens, whenever we played against him, he always played well. It was just whether it was that again, coming to Wolves at the time, we had players, we had we had a good squad. We had players at the, at the time they spent money. So people would come to the to the games with a, a little bit more of a almost like a, a wanting to play against them because Wolves were a big club. So people like him would would cause you problems, you know. It was players like that you weren't actually not big names, but they'd always come and play well. Players like that, but there'd, there'd probably be too many to mention, uh, to be honest, in and around that time um, that would come to Wolves and there'd be a handful. I mean, like I said, we, you know, we've been fortunate, we're even in the Championship, you know, King Cladsey came and played against us. The Fulham team, when they absolutely smashed the league, Lee Clarks and people like that, they were always players that... Yeah, Louis Sartre. Sartre. Louis Sartre, they, you know, they gave you problems. It was always great, you know, the, 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 the Black Country derbies were great. Bob Taylor, you know. I know he's a West Brom legend, which he is. He was always a problem when we played against him. So there's 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 far too many of that era that we came up against. But it was a it was a tough league. It, you know, it was difficult. We couldn't get out of it, and we had, you know, lots of people have asked us many times how come we didn't with the squad we had, and I've answered it the same every time. I've no idea. If you've got some questions for uh, Simon, for those who join us live on YouTube, so I'll quickly drop them in. Eddie, have you got anything you'd like to ask Simon? 
Um, well, I mean, I was <clears throat> just, you know, on, on the sort of uh, on the sort of shirt. Have you got? Have you not got at least not just even one one shirt in the drawer in the cupboard in the loft somewhere? Yeah, I've, 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 I probably have, mate. I've probably got yeah, a couple yeah. somewhere tucked up there. I, I think I've definitely somewhere along the line. I've got the light blue away shirt. I yeah, think. Brilliant. Yeah, that's a great that one. That gives me away. the absolute jeep as that away kit does. Yeah, it wasn't, the, it wasn't a good season. Away with a Darren Peacock. I think got injured on his debut. I think um, we lost one 0 Lee Hughes hadn't scored for like seven or eight games past Wolves, and that was the first time he scored past us. Yeah, yeah. I've got. I'm sure I've got that. I, my family somewhere along the line. You know, I've got photographs when we all had kits at the start of the time. So I probably have somewhere somewhere up in the loft got a, a couple tucked away. Um, I, I, I'd have to check. I'm not sure. But I, I, I think I've definitely got the blue, the light blue away shirt. Well, they're worth they're worth they're worth a lot of money these days, Aussie. Yeah. So yeah, probably but, massive. But, probably. Fit but I always, <clears throat> but then I, you know, it's this kind of it's this tricky thing where as a as a collector and as a fan, like I love getting the shirts, but then I also I feel a bit sad when players kind of sell all their shirts. I always think, you know, surely keep a couple, you know. I mm-hmm. mean, but then I've I spoke to a few other players. Like I I also collect um England goalkeeper shirts, and I, I've had a, a few chats with some um some youth team players, under twenty one players, Russell Howarth. Yeah, and if you've uh, uh, ever played against him or with him, but um, uh, um, they they would sort of tell me, well, look, you know, Ed, I've got I've got the memories, you know, what I've got is the memories, you know, I've I've got the memories, I've got the pictures, you know, I don't need I don't these they don't need these bits of fabric, like that was my life and I lived it, so it's different for someone you know collectors as opposed to it is to former players, like you've 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 lived those times, you're looking at these photos and you've got these, mm. these great stories and these memories. So you don't need a bit of, a bit of nylon, a bit of fabric to, uh, to remember it all. Yeah, it wasn't that. Like I said, I, I did have them. And at, at certain times, you know, people would, would ask, is there a shirt that can donate to charity? So I've always done stuff like that. Not, listen, I don't want to pat on the back for it, but I've, you know, like you say, I've had those memories. I've been able to play. If I can give a little bit back, you know, I've sent a Tramia shirt that I had that I didn't actually realize I had. He asked me if I had anything from it. So, you know, I've sent it on. It's just, like I said, seeing the photographs and being able to play, it's great. Um, being able to tell my kids and being able to show them that I've done it, brilliant. Their grandkids, no problem. That that stays there. Um, I don't have shirts up anywhere particularly. I've got some photographs on the wall um, of certain things. I still need to get the Figo one. I haven't done that one yet. Um, <laughs> that's, on, that's on my list to do. Um, I didn't even know that Gaza photograph existed till about probably a month ago when I was trying to find a Figo one and then someone said, there's this. So it is, but that, that's the things, the memories that the, being able to, to say that I played um, professional football for, for nine and 20 years is, is, is testament enough that what, what I want to do. Um, the shirts, like I said, I didn't really swap shirts. It wasn't something I went to do. Um, well, it, well it was a, it was a it was a different era as well. I mean, what would the kit man have said if you if you yeah, went to that mad. game pre pre season against Barcelona and you all swapped shirts? <laughs> what would the kit man have said? It'd have gone, it'd have gone, it'd have gone absolutely going mad. back on the shirt cost, isn't it? That? <laughs> yeah, it'd have gone mad. But even now, I think I saw something um, quite recently that even nowadays they get they still only get a certain amount of shirts and then they have to buy the rest. But again, in today's wages, it's probably nothing, is it? You know, yeah, it's, it's a lot of money to buy a shirt. But in in today's society, what they're earning and these players, it's not the end of the world, is it? They've, they've got it in their cup holders of their like Bugatti Veyrons, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. um, Charlie, Charlie Spliff in the comment section. Uh, Simon, that's who who was your favourite player at Wolves during your time there? Favourite player, as in who let's, I played with? Play, yeah, um, who who's your favourite player to have played with? And we'll maybe, maybe follow that on by who's your best mate? Uh, Bully was one of the ones that me and Bully got on really well for some reason. Obviously, I I don't say I made him a lot of goals, but we had a sort of understanding of what it was. I like to play forward. Yes, I gave the ball away sometimes, but I'd rather give the ball away trying to play forward sometimes than just being safe and keeping it. Um, he made great runs and I was able sometimes to find him. So that was good um, with that. Well, probably my best mate was Neil Emblem. Um, we kind of... We're sort of from around the same area when I moved up. Um, obviously, Neil he, was, he was there. Bromley and you was Croydon, was it? Yeah, but I was originally Croydon. He was sort of Bromley and out that way. Um, his dad had been non league and my dad was non league type stuff. So we, we kind of resonated together. We've got a, a really good story about that. He probably didn't tell you that. Um, I get to know you, Knight, that he incorporated lots of alcohol. Um, As they do. 
as it does. Um, yeah, that probably Neil was probably my best mate at the time there. So I got on best with Neil. Um, but Bully, Bully for me as a midfield player, we live and die by centre forwards. Simple as that. Our intro uh, music to our review shows is pretty much the commentary of uh, your assist for Bully in the 3-2 win at home to uh, Birmingham. Uh, literally one of the most balmiest games I was I went to as a youth. Um, Kevin Francis somehow managed to get a penalty that day. I don't know if you've got any memories <laughs> of that game. It was a penalty. Was it really? Yeah. Dino caught him. Is it? Yeah. There's it a lot of Wolves fans will be shocked by that. We should, we should have let him shoot. He'd have never scored anyway. You know, so yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. Was it was terrible, wasn't it? For, uh, no, that. listen, he's a, he was a handful. Listen, I, I, whatever anyone ever says, and I say this to, and, you know, I coach now with people. People want to detract away. If you become a professional footballer, you're with yeah. a 1%. So yeah. for whatever it is, um, you know, it, 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 it's not fortune. Yes, I'm just jealous, Simon. Yeah. He was like six foot yeah, seven, no, I'm five I know. foot three. Listen, I <laughs> I'm know. just jealous of the guy. Six foot seven, he was massive. But that's what I'm saying. My daughter's a, a you know musical theatre dance. It's the same thing. It's very. It's a tough industry. There's a lot of sacrifices to be made. There's a lot of luck that comes into becoming a pro. But if you become a pro footballer, I would never. You know, it, it hurts me when people say he's this because, and it hurts me sometimes when pro footballers say it or ex footballers say it about certain people that they're not this and not that. It's it's not an easy thing to get into, um, and for people to sort of dig them out sometimes. Listen, there's criticism's fine. Certain things aren't. Yeah, this is uh, this is the. Uh... The social media industry now so people like myself who have never kicked a ball um, on a saturday afternoon even at non-league level come on here and uh, critique professional football no, listen crit criticism is fine and opinion yeah. is fine yeah. you're a fan you have the right you pay our wages effectively you have the right to say certain things it can't get personal and you can't detract away from what they are they are pro footballers they don't mean to make mistakes of course we don't uh, we, we don't mean to go out and play badly we don't mean to go out and and ball it or give away a penalty the fact is, you're allowed to talk about it. The, the, I think the problem with VAR is you're taking away a lot of the chat you used to have on a Saturday after the games, sitting in pubs and discussing what happened and yeah. why it weren't a pen and whatever else. We've now gone to the point where we're taking that away. About the actual Critique, in as I said, your critique's going. fine. Uh, criticism is fine. That's part and parcel of what we do. That's what, you know, you get to where you are, you're going to have to suffer that. I, you know, I have no issues with that at all. One of the players who was uh, very pleasing on the eye to watch at Wolves during your time um, was uh, Fernando Gomez, who you met earlier on in the year in Valencia. How did that meeting come about, Simon? I've kept in touch little bits and pieces with Fernando. We, I, again, another player I got on really well with, obviously, you know, one part of the role of me, I was obviously part of um, players that have been around, so I, I was local. I'd sort of welcome the guys in, try and show them around, keep them, you know, try and integrate them back into the squad, if that makes sense. And we talked a few times on Twitter and bits and pieces. And then I was going to Valencia and text him. Um, I was just going out there for, for, for sort of a long weekend. I text Fernando and said, listen, if, if you're in and around, I'd love to catch up with you. We catched up, had, had a bit of a coffee, had a bit of a chat about Wolves, a bit of a chat. You know, he's gone on to, to, to Valencia. He was general manager there, something else. He, he was, um, he was, he, appre he appreciated people that could play football and listened and, and learned. And when you get someone that comes from La Liga who's done what he's done, why wouldn't you listen to him? He was a technically top, top-notch footballer, technically superb. Um, I think he's one of the first midfield players to score 100 goals in La Liga. There's loads of different stats about Fernando that if you actually looked into it, he, you know, some of the goals he scored in, in La Liga, were, you know, from a midfield player, he's like that. He's probably what you would class now as a number 10 but he wasn't classed that back then. He was a midfield player. All of a sudden, these this 10, 8, 6, 4, it's all evolved out of FIFA and whatever else. But Fernando was just the technically left, right foot, great first touch, could pass the ball, could head it. You know, he was just an all-round good footballer. You don't play for Spain and be average. And I just got on well with Fernando and talked to him and asked him questions. And yeah, we were, we were just that. So I just went out and had a little chat with him and had a coffee in the morning with him and, and that was it really. Just an absolute player, both feet, vision, like you said, a, a number 10 in today's game. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd like to ask Simon, Eddie? Um, I mean, I I, so, uh, I guess maybe a question about your your uh, managerial career, Ozzy. Is it ever something you, you, you think you might try stepping back into again? Uh, no, not anymore. Not anymore. Obviously, when I, when I went to... Uh, 
well, part of the reason we got back to Warsaw, obviously, I got on really well with Colin Lee. He took me with Mark McGee to Reading, um, and I got on really well with my, uh, Colin. He can be funny at certain times. That was just his demeanour. And then he took me back to Warsaw, and that was why he was going to help me go down the coaching route, which I did. Um, Paul obviously lost his job towards the end of that season. Paul then went in. I helped out Paul a little bit. The following season, I'd sort of joined in a little bit, but it was very difficult. I still wanted to play so much, and it was very difficult combining the two. So I took a step back again just to play. And then in my last season, helped him out a lot. Um, assistant manager, stroke coach, uh, and really enjoyed it. That sort of bit. I was then 34. That was sort of the way I was going. And my, obviously, I'd had problems with my knee. Not then. I'd, I'd been really lucky. But I knew at some point I was going to have to be start playing less. So that's when I got sort of done. It started doing my badges, started doing that stuff. Didn't it? And then it got to the end of it. And I actually applied for the Walsall job. Um to, to try and get back into it. It just wasn't, probably wasn't quite the right time. Maybe being associated with the previous management didn't help because um, it hadn't been a great time over that sort of three years. And it um, it didn't quite happen. It didn't quite happen for me there. I then flitted around a little bit and ended up at Hereford um, for a short term. And they offered me a contract till January. Um, but my wife, uh, what well, my family, we've had a couple of little bits and pieces that had happened back home, and she just wanted to come back home. We travelled a lot, um, and I, you know, she'd made a lot of sacrifices throughout my career. And I thought at that time, uh, you know, a short-term contract at Hereford to to, to move him back uh, and seeing what I could happen. I just made that decision. I thought it felt it was the right the right time for me to come home, as in home to where my wife and I are from, and. Uh, see what happened from there. Again, trying to get back into a football club at the time, never really did it and ended up at Bromley, um, which is my local club playing. Uh, Mark Goldberg, the Crystal Palace fame, Mark Goldberg was manager. Um, Bobby Bowery, another player played with Palace was there. So I ended up there, ended up managing Bromley and then sort of played, my, I played my last competitive game in non-league at 42. So I've done a bit of management stints and went around there and done that. I still coach I coach on a, a couple of nights with Bobby in, in Croydon Way, um, which I love. I love coaching, but I won't go back into that. My son's a referee now, um, so I don't. I don't particularly. It's it's been too long gone. It's been too long gone. The game's changed too much for me. Um, I love coaching, but management side of it, no, I won't. I would never go back into it now. I've, I've gone a different path. Much as I love football and I miss it every single day, it's just it's just something that I won't go back into. Unless my son decides to be the FIFA ref, which he's going to be, and then I'll watch him do that. That's it. You mentioned Crystal Palace earlier, and a, and a few Wolves players have mentioned in the past. Where does that playoff home fixture against Crystal Palace rank for you in regards to atmospheres? It was the away one worse because we were 2-1 down. We were we didn't play very well at all, but we gave away a late goal to make it 3-1, and it gave them that bit of cushion. As I've said in, in previous you know, podcasts and stuff I've done, that was one of the best atmospheres I've played in, uh, the return leg under the lights. And we played well, in fairness, but we just couldn't get that that goal to take it any further. Um, it was a it was a funny season for me that one. I loved it, but that you know hindsight's a wonderful thing. That caused me a lot of issues with my knee because I played from March through to the end of the season with a problem. Um, but that listen that doesn't make it any difference. It was just we were going for promotion. I don't want to come out the team. I want to play. So that you know that was a it was a tough one to take that because. As I said, we didn't play well at Palace away um, and then gave away a really bad goal to go 3-1 down and then scoring early at home and, and whatever else. We just couldn't find that, that, that third one, giving away that. It was it was disappointing that season because I think we should have done it. That season was the one where we really should have gone and got promoted. Yeah, Carlisle Nash was like Peter Schumacher that night. from oh, yeah. We just couldn't break them down, could we? No, exactly that. And that's what I'm saying. That was probably the one where I think at any time, if we'd have done, if we'd have won that game, I think we'd have got we'd have got promoted. Just a sort of quick, quick switch of direction. Growing up as a as a lad, who was your team back in the day? Because one of the cup runs that Wolves had, we we beat Wimbledon in one of the rounds. And I'm wondering if there's any sort of vibe towards Wimbledon being from the Croydon way. No, my my team as a kid was Tottenham purely, but it wasn't Tottenham. It was purely Glenn Hoddle. I loved Glenn Hoddle yeah. as a player. So I liked watching Tottenham. I didn't really have a team. Palace were my local side, but Tottenham was the team I used to watch in the, the sort of early 80s with Ben Hoddle and people like that. So that was, he was my favourite player. Um, Palace was my local side, but I didn't, didn't go and see him a lot. I'd go every now and then uh, in that sort of period and then signing for him because it was my local club. 
I signed for him in, uh, as soon as I left school. So I was an apprentice in, I think it was 88. When I signed, I was an apprentice on a YTS scheme. So I was in, my district team was Croydon. The Croydon manager had something to do with Palace. So we all then came into it. it completely different to now. You know, we, there was no, we had a uh, two, one Irish lad, one Scottish lad, and whatever else. Now it's so, so, so different. Um, you know, they probably don't, clean boots they probably don't pump up balls they probably don't break the ice to do stuff they probably don't set up cones it's it was great um you know and you got your yts money but it was um it was sort of two years that was i'll never forget it was it was it was a it was a rude awakening coming out of school to palace as an apprentice but it was brilliant um but they weren't neither of them my side tottenham i i just love football and at that time that, that was who i sort of resonated to was tottenham but palace was my local team uh, Morp of Wolves commented saying fantastic listening to your life in football Simon so intriguing loved watching you play at Wolves um, what was sort of one or two of you, your, your favourite victories for, for Wolves I looked at sort of some of the results um, uh, earlier on via Wikipedia the Leeds FA Cup win and quarter final was up there obviously I think we've done the double over West Brom the one season yeah. what, what's some what's some of your favourite victories for yeah, Wolves West, West Brom was obviously a big one uh, we got the 3-0 I think it was at home uh, away sorry at their place wasn't it I think it was 3-0 Four that two. was a big one. Yeah, 4-2. Four, four yeah, you Leeds and Bob didn't they? Yeah, Leeds was obviously a massive one for us to, to get us into the semis. Um, was, was your knee causing you an issue? That's why you didn't play in the semi? No, I got suspended. I got sent off at Ipswich. Oh, <laughs> well, do you remember the sending off? Was it? Yeah, I booted Bobby Petter twice. Um, I didn't even realise at the time. I, we was having a shocker. It, it, Ipswich was a tough team to play against. You had Kieran Dyer, Matty Holland, you know, people like that. We just weren't playing well. So, you know, sometimes you try and do something to, to get a bit of a reaction. Uh, Bobby Petter was a bit quick for me. I ended up upending him twice in the space of about 12 minutes and got sent off and didn't even realise I got suspended for the for the semi-final. Um, and that was, a you know, people have talked about that. There was some strange... Uh, well, Bully didn't start, for one. I don't think Keeney started for another. Um, yeah. Steve Clary started, from what I can remember. Steve's a great, great guy, but yeah, that was one. Obviously, any game against West Brom, I gave away a penalty, I think, in my first ever Black Country derby that Stowley saved, luckily. Um, so that was quite interesting uh, for me to do that. But yeah, they're, they're sort of the main ones, I would say. Anything um, against them, it was it was big. Uh, Birmingham, obviously at home, there, there were a couple of games that always stand out. But fortunately, setting up a couple of goals there always always makes it nicer but um, yeah they're sort of the ones you sort of remember most I, I would say obviously you made uh, throughout your career you, you made the most appearances for Wolves obviously it's just it is a, a proud time for you looking back yeah massively yeah I, like I said it, injury permitted you know I, I had I missed games a lot of games for injuries and and and, um, and that was purely just my knee really it, it was it was a problem it caused me problems and um but I love my time there, obviously, to, to captain the club um, at some point, be club captain and captain games in there. It, it's, it, it was an honour for me to do that. Um, yeah, like I said, I spent a lot of time there. My kids were brought up and, and born there. Um, loved the area, uh, loved playing there. And, it, and like I said, it was the most games I played, but I should have played a lot more. I think I could have played a lot more if, if I'd have done things differently. Hindsight, as I've talked to you about before, is a wonderful thing, but... At the time, we were chasing promotion, so you kind of sacrifice certain things um, to do it. I've, I spoke about it before. I, I, I would plan a Saturday, and this and again, this is not me sitting here moping or, or asking for anyone to pat me on the back and sympathy, but I plan a Saturday. My knee was that bad. The doctor would come in and drain my knee on a Monday um, because it was so swollen and inflammatory. If we had a game Tuesday, I'd struggle to play for Tuesday, depending on how it was, and then get back through and play again Saturday, and it was the same sort of scenario for that. But we were going for promotion. Why wouldn't you do it? And then I spent the whole summer after that season. I went to two or three specialists with it. There was, it was all caused. Now I know from an injury I got from Reading way back, and basically I went all the way through a summer with a new program. Uh, done all that to the following season. Came in pre-season, started the, the work, running fine. Started doing a little bit more. When it started getting more intense, it was literally I came off the I came off the training pitch. Um, to Colin Lee after working all the way through the summer to get to, to, to strengthen my knee, as the guy had said to me. And I came off crying, literally crying, saying, my knee's killing me. This is, this is, you know, it's not good. And that's when I ended up having the operation the day Keeney was scoring um, at Norwich. And so I had the operation on that day and it took me, I think, four months, I think, before I got back 
uh, to that. And that was back. That, if I, if that hadn't worked, that was my that was done. That was my career over, finished. And I would have been twenty eight. I think I was then, roughly. But it, it, like I said to you, it's not. I'm not asking for sympathy. It's what you do as a as a, as a professional football player at the time. But it was a it was a tough time then. A tough time because again, people then start doubting you. I, I, I even know Colin Lee at the time. I spoke to him about it previously. He doubted that I'll ever come back to playing like properly again. He doubted that as a manager, um, which is which is not an easy thing. But you know, it's what it is. To put a different angle onto it, and um, this sort of that based on what you just said, it pretty much shows the ability that you had. That even with all those sort of injury issues, you were still a player that most managers wanted to play on on a weekend. With those issues, yeah, listen, like we, Ledley King for Tottenham, we had massive, yeah, no, let's, my, mine's not a Ledley King issue. I could still train, I could still function through it. it that, that period was only a three month, two and two and a half month period of, of when it was like that. The majority of the other times, I could I could train and, and, and train as normal. It was just there as, as I got older, things started changing. So at Warsaw, I was actually uh, lucky over those three years. I could, I played the most amount of games, would you believe, at the end of my career because things had moved forward and I was able to manage it better um, just as things were. But at the time, it was, like I said, it didn't stop me training most of the time. It was just that, the t- you know, I played, I was six years there, I played 160-odd games, I think, or 170-odd games. But without the injuries that I had, you know, I'd have been touch wood, I'd have played a lot more. Um, but, yeah, it, it's just what it is. I was never blessed with the most amount of pace, let's put it that way. Um, pace wasn't my, my my forte. I was lucky that I had a decent first touch and could pass the ball. Um, and again, I wasn't afraid to hide. You know, people would say that. So, yeah, it's it's. Listen, it's not. I don't see it as a, a downside. It's just the, the fact of that's what it was at that, at that time. I'd love to have played a lot more games, but uh, um, unfortunately, sometimes I couldn't. Let's look uh, positive for the last five minutes of the show before we close here. Now, before the show, I did tell you, Simon, that uh, yep. I've got a list in front of me. The top 25 players um, that you played with in, in regards to quantity of appearances during your time at Wolves. So from one to 25, if you pick me uh, a number, I'm going to say what player that is. And I'd like either just uh, a quick description of their ability or hopefully an anecdote about that Fine. player. Fine. One to 25. Eight. Number eight is... An, an, another number ten that I class myself as back in the, in the uh, the nineties. Steve Corica, Steve Corica, fantastic ability. Steve, great footballer, left and right foot from Australia. Fans never took to Steve. Again, same thing. Got a bit of an injury. Um, great lad. Went on to again another one. You would never say Steve's a manager. Went on to manage Sydney Olympics and everything. Like but yeah, really good guy, Steve. Good footballer. Just never quite never quite hit the heights of Wolves. Wolves never really took to him, and he didn't really hit the heights of Wolves. It came with from uh, it was like another one of those signings, yes, wasn't he? At the time, came with uh, a, a bit of a decent transfer fee. Mark McGee brought him in. Yeah, he, he was, was probably s- similar, like a, probably like a number eight now, wasn't he? he had yeah, he was. He, box he, to yeah, box he, another, he had an eye for goal. Yeah, he was another one. Again, two footed, good, good skills, great like that, but just never quite hit off at Wolves. Okay, next number eleven. Eleven, your best mate Neil Emblem. No, nah, there's nothing. I don't need to say anything about him. Neil was a ledge. Yeah, he's, he's, I, I, you know, he loves Wolves. He's just Neil is the most honest guy you'll ever meet. Like I said to you, there was when I first come up to Wolves, and he was one of the guys I know. We we had a he was living out in uh, where would he be in Compton at the time, and I was in the hotel, so whatever else. And he sort of said, I said, Look, no, yeah, come round, okay, come round, bring a couple of beers. So I bought a couple of beers around. We ended up, I think, we drank far too much um, that evening, just getting to know, chatting, and whatever else. And, and like I said, he was he was great to me when I first moved up. Um, I was good for him. Uh, he was, he played everywhere. He was, he, you know, he was, you know, he, he just wouldn't, he'd never moan. Um, I, I don't think I've genuinely ever heard um, the utility man description be Perfect. used for someone like, he literally yeah. could play everywhere. I don't was, think he played in goal for Wolves, but he would have done a decent job if he went in. Probably, yeah. But what I'm saying to you, it was, it was a hindrance to him as well as a, a blessing, if that made sense, because he could play anywhere. Um, sweeper, but I actually Neil made his debut. This is a when I played for Reading against Wolves. My made my debut for Reading against Wolves, and he had an absolute yeah, shocker. He mentioned he that trod on the ball and all sorts. How you beat us that day, I'll never know. Stowley played really well, and you beat us. Uh, uh, us, I say us. I was at Reading at the time, and Neil Gribbers, whatever he was called at the time, had an absolute shocker. 
So I remember Reading being quite a decent team back then. Shaka is lopping goal that day. Yeah, we, we, that's it. That was the year. Obviously, I signed there from Palace, um, and we finished second that season. So should have gone up automatically, but we got the the league was being reduced to twenty, and we lost to Bolton in the final four three at, in the playoff final that season. And that was the, the, the season I got injured New Year's Eve and came back in March with my knee. And that played me up to the end of the season. And I had another operation at the end of that season and then signed for QPR. And then ended up, so I, let, I signed for QPR in July, June and signed for Wolves in December. Neil was a ledge. He is. I said to you before, when I, when I spoke to Neil Emblem off air a, a few years ago, the, the enthusiasm that he's got for Wolves as a club, it's, yeah, it's up there it. with, with the people on this uh, fan cast. Yeah. Eddie, is there a player you like to ask Simon about? Uh, well, Think about those mid nineties era players. I mean, uh, I mean, I guess he was he was sort of uh, coming in when you were going out. But I, I, I've heard a lot of great stories, anecdotes, well, good and bad, about Adam Proudlock uh, towards the end of his career. What was he like as a as a young man? Was he did he like Proudy, to kind of you know? Proudy had unbelievable ability. Um, he came in like you say right towards the end of mine, more more under Dave Jones's era, obviously because I left in that sort of. Dave came in at Christmas. I left in the March. But Proudy was, yeah, he's a character. Um, could score goals. Had all the ability about him. Again, unfortunately, got a few injuries. But um, liked a night out. Um, liked a little bit of a tint in his hair. Um, but he's a, he's a good lad, Adam. He's a, he's, he is a good lad. He still pops up every now and then. He's, I think he might be there Sunday, actually, for the, for the charity game, in fairness. But, yeah, good guy, Adam. A good guy. Right, you we'll go with three more players and then we'll call it a night. Next number. Uh fifteen. Fifteen. Darren Baisley. Bays, another ledge. Bays, I still speak to now. Uh, again, another guy. Both He's footed. Just just steady Eddie, Darren. Just steady Eddie. Great cross of a ball. Fit guy, up and down. Play again anywhere, anywhere you ask him to. Now the All Whites coach, would you believe, for New Zealand. So he's the All Whites head coach. Um, they played Australia the other day. We didn't catch up, we missed each other, but he again, there was a, it was a funny one. We all ended up at Walsall, but I, you know, there was myself, Neil, and Darren were very close. We all lived within quite close proximity of each other, so we saw each other quite a lot. So again, I'd sometimes text them and go, and I'm walking my dog. Basically, that meant I needed a pint and I wanted to go down the road for a pint. So I'd say, I'm going to walk the dog, lads. Anyone coming out? So it was like a bit of a code thing because the, the wives would be honest. So I'd walk the dog and we'd go and have a quick pint. Um, and yeah, we used to end up. We we spent a lot of time together. The three of us spent a lot of time together. Cheers, Adam. Uh, Vori Nieke with uh, the comment highlights. Keep up the good work. Enjoying the podcast. Uh, two more players. Uh, numbers one to twenty-five. Uh, four. Number four, Carl Robinson, a, a midfield that, that I know you've spoke highly of in the past. Yeah, Robbo again. Um, young lad coming through. Took him a little bit under my wing, Robbo. To be fair to him, again, another one got on to do great things as a manager. Um, had Robbo was an unbelievable, would you believe it, for a midfielder, a great finisher. Um, obviously went on to play for Wales and whatever else. Great finisher, good lad. Had a little bit of cockiness about him, which was good. Um, used to get a bit above his station every now and then, so he needed a little clip round here. But he was a uh, again another one of those sort. Of, came through sort of that Robbie Keane, him, Keith Andrews. They're all that sort of that sort of thing. But Robbo was a good lad. Listened. Um, I got on well. I played well with with Cole. In for some reason, we just kind of hit it off well. At the time, I liked to to sit a little bit deeper. Cole liked to arrive in the box and had that, that knack of scoring goals. And he, as I said to you, he was a good finisher, Cole, and a good lad um, with it. Again, he lived quite. We, 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 I lived when I moved into sort of outside of Wolverhampton. They lived. There was him and Michael Branch who lived in flats very close to me. Um, but yeah, good guy. Michael Branch is on this list. Uh, Morp of Wolves has a comment with a fantastic comment. Always remember Paige Frigo back in the day, naming Darren Bays as a dream man. Um, <laughs> she, must liked, she, must liked, she must have liked hairy men. Silver Fox. I think that's why he's manager of the All Whites now, isn't it? Because that would have liked <laughs> could've, what, that could've been days that, They must right. have liked him for that. Last number between 1 to 25. 21. 21. Scorer of that... Um, Late consolation at Crystal Palace uh, away in the playoffs. Jamie Smith, Jinxie. Jamie, yeah. No, again, Jinky was a um, great guy. Birmingham lad. Plenty about him. But um, steady Eddie. Great, great player. Again, you're talking about all these players. He's now a coach. He coaches alongside, you know, he coaches alongside bosses like Darren Moore. So, Darren Moore, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah, so he's done his stint. But again, Oh, Robinson's with Wayne Rooney now as well, isn't he? Yeah, fit guy. 
up and down. Good footballer. Um, not the loudest. Got on really well with Dean Richards at the time. Oh, God bless his soul. Um, bit of a, they had a bit of banter between them, those two boys. But um, yeah, give him plenty of stick. He used to get loads of it. He was another one that ended up, I think he was part of the, the transfer between Dougie Freeman coming to Wolves and uh, right, was it yeah. Neil and Jamie went the other way. Yeah, that's it. Neil and Jamie went to Palace and Dougie came the other way to us uh, at the time and we got money from as well, I think it was. That was the Mark Goldberg area again, who I had signed for at Bromley. Right, so the last player that I want to ask you about and every Wolves player that we've had around that area has come on has mentioned some form of story about him, whether it's funny or just repulsive, is Steve Sedgley. Sedge, yeah, no, he, listen, he was, um, again, good footballer, strange lad. Um, he was the only man that I knew that got quieter the more he drunk. Um, so normally people get a little bit louder, but he'd go the opposite way because he was crazy without the drink. And it, you know, we'd come out to warm up and he'd start doing gymnastics and forward rolls and stuff like that. He just wasn't, he wasn't the full ticket at the time, Steve, but, um, Again, a good footballer. Struggled a little bit for injuries and played for him, but people wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't say the same. But yeah, he was the only man I knew that went the opposite way with drink. It's an odd one. I've never heard that go the other way. And I'm, I can, did, yeah. I can definitely testify. Quite, I don't go that way when I drink. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Most people would get a little bit louder, a little bit more, you know, confident. It'd get worse. He'd just basically not bother talking to anyone and just sort of sit in the corner and drink. At least it's not Don Goodman and fall asleep in a nightclub, but there you go. Eddie, anything further you want to add before we close the show? Because that 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 teal away top, it, one of one of my earliest sort of memories is that free kick you scored at Bramall Lane. Sorry, but that that teal away top. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had if I had one more question, favorite favorite Wolves goal. That you my scored? favorite Wolves goal. Uh, is it that chip? Scored. That chip against. Chip, yeah, there's different bits. The first, obviously, my first goal is a big one for me because it wasn't an easy time coming to a club that's struggling to score that against Watford. Two um, two, two, two buzzes out of nowhere, wasn't it, at the time? You'd gone for quite a few months without scoring and then two yeah, in one game. Yeah, and then two that day. That was, a, you know, the chip was a good, you know, for me was a good goal. Uh, Fulham away, wrong foot, decent sort of thing. Um, that's why you like that blue away top, isn't it? It gives me the jeepers, but that blue away top. Do you know what? I didn't even remember it's that one. Yeah, that was yeah, there. So, left foot yeah, that, the, the my ball. first goal, probably the chip were, were, were good goals for me. Again, both being at home um, obviously makes a big difference. I, I remember scoring important goal, or, or uh, I played Boxing Day with a bit Oxford. I think I got two at the Oxford game on Boxing Day once, which was good for me because a lot of my family had come up from London to watch that game when we played Boxing Day, full house. I think we beat Oxford 3-1. Um, I th think it was 3-1 on the Boxing Day and I managed to get a couple. Um, was was good for me as well. So, yeah, they, they were probably the ones. But the, the chip, I liked. I like chipping keepers. It's, it's a talent. That's why that's why I put you up there. Really a, I know you don't want to hear it. I know you want to be modest or you like. But yeah, it's for a, me, that sort of 90s era, seeing you yeah, score guys nice. like that, you know, the, Brazilian R9 was like my hero back then. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeah. Give that, you give those players during that time more credibility than you probably would do now, which is... That's yeah, that, again, it, 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 there's lots to talk about that, isn't it? Who's the best ever centre forward and who's the best number nine in the, that, that era? Um, R9's up there, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's, I don't think you can compare. Ronaldo and Messi are a different era, a bit later. But if you had a front three, I think that's your front three, isn't it? In the last 20 years. R9, Ronaldo and Messi. That's some front three. Yeah. And you're missing out Suarez, by the way, from 2010 or 2012 to whatever it is, who's got unbelievable stats. You, but yeah, that was probably they're, they're my probably, you know, I do, I do like showing them to people every now and then to say I did, I can play honestly, kids. When I'm coaching them, when they look at me and go, "Who the hell are you?" It's like you mentioned earlier, a, mid a midfielder that isn't afraid to to make a mistake as long as you're trying to be direct. That's the sort of midfielder I've always wanted to see in a wolf side. Football has become a bit passive and a bit too possession based for me at times. So. When you when you have got a player that wants to sort of break the lines with penetrative passes, that's that's what I want to see as a midfielder. Yeah, I think like I said it's just it wasn't. I didn't do it as a it, just the way I played from from growing up. It wasn't it wasn't something I tried to do. Um, you know, Kevin De Bruyne doesn't try to do what he does, and his stats are, are way down on anyone else. But everyone's talking about Harlan missing De Bruyne now. But he, you know, his pass completion will be down in the seventies. Um, you know, where some of them was up in the nineties. It's it's we didn't have all that. Back then, we'd have certain things of how many touches of the ball we get, and like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to take the ball under pressure. If it wasn't going well for me, I'm not going to hide. Um, so sometimes you take a bit of flack for that. It is what it is. I'm not, 
you know, I'm big enough and ugly enough to look after myself and, and take that on board. And it, it's not going to change the way I played. It didn't change the way I played uh, more or less all through my career. And, and and like I said, some people are going to say, you're not the greatest player in the world or you're rubbish. We could use more explicitives, but others will say, yeah, we liked it. One of my favourite players, football, Simon. I'll keep telling you, and every time I see you, I, I love you in a wall shirt. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Wolves Fancast tonight, part of the, no all the uh, podcast network. Eddie at Wolves Football Shirts, thanks for joining us. We'll be back on uh, Sunday night, hopefully with a good result after our fixture at home to Newcastle. Playing the show out tonight is uh, one of our favourite Wolverhampton, West Midlands bands, Rose Asylum, who've got their new single, Heaven Once Told You, out next Friday. Head over to their Instagram page, pre-save the link. Here's a song now. Yeah.